Welcome to the Scale Up Valley podcast, where we bring the best of the best to help you scale your business from 1 million to 1 trillion. To discuss uh, how to scale uh, an amazing scale up like 15.5, we have a very special guest today. Uh, his name is Brad McGinnity, the CRO or Chief Revenue, Revenue Officer at uh, 15.5. Brad, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me a bit. Uh, again, Mike, it's a pleasure to be with you. Second time. Absolutely. And uh, just for the ones who were not able to listen the previous episode, and for the ones who have not listened to it, you consider it a very good summary of all your knowledge. Let's try to do the same today, but much more adapted to the COVID-19 uh, crisis that we are all living uh, today. But just yeah. a quick intro about yourself and uh, 15.5. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll try to keep it fairly succinct here. Uh, I've spent my entire career in software startups. Um, I've been uh, at a bootstrapped company. I then co-founded a venture-backed company. Uh, those first two businesses were uh, doing marketing technology, so MarTech, with, uh, and e-commerce was specifically the industry that we sold into. Uh, for the last three years, I've now been in the world of uh, HR technology and business technology at 15.5. Um, 15.5's helped managers to be better managers. Uh, we offer software that improves the employee and manager relationship uh, through a weekly check-in process. That's where our name comes from, a questionnaire that takes about 15 minutes for an employee to fill out, five minutes for the manager to review and respond. And most of that conversation is built on OKRs. Uh, so we have an OKRs module to help manage your quarterly, semi-annual, or annual goals. We combine that with a performance review, a place for a weekly one-on-one uh, -on -one agenda, and something that we call high fives to give one another peer recognition. So uh, it's a really fun product. We combine it with something that we call best self management. Best self management is really a philosophical oh, mindset and orientation towards great leadership. We believe that the software by itself is really critical and that the fastest way to become an expert at something is a checklist. And we essentially build a process around a lot of the conversations that should happen between employee and manager. So we build that checklist that helps the manager to become a better manager. However, we really become fantastic at leading when we combine this with the right mindset and philosophy and orientation. And so best self-management is about creating a growth mindset in your people through autonomy, mastery, and purpose. We combine that with relatedness to create ramp. Um, and now we have the right mindset with hopefully the right structure and process that really helps people to excel and achieve their goals. Love it. Uh, it's all <laughs> good ingredients for the kind of work that uh, that I do, uh, and a very good tool to to leverage a uh, system to um, to leverage. Just for the ones, as you know, we have been extending the kind of scale of the show. Uh, we have started covering the journey from one million to one hundred million. And yep. then we have scaled it a little bit, going from 100 million to 1B with companies as Qualtrics, ServiceNow, et cetera. And now uh, Bayer, Fujifilm, Worth companies going from 1B to, to 1 tree in, in some of the last episodes. Uh, definitely, as we said in the beginning, 15.5 is going from 1 to 100 million. But if you can reduce a little bit the interval, <laughs> where, where are you in, in this journey? And uh, what is the ad count uh, kind of? Yep funding rounds, et cetera? Yeah, uh, great question. So the company started in 2012 and um, raised a little bit of capital, kind of bootstrapping around cash flow break even for several years as the market formed uh, around what we're doing. And so we raised a series A in October of 2018. We then raised a series B uh, last summer, which right now we're particularly thankful for um, having that B done and not yeah. trying to raise a B today, which would have been about the 18, 24 month mark. Um, so we raised... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So in that nine month period, we raised uh, almost $40 million, which was fantastic and super helpful to have a strong balance sheet today. Um, we're about 200 employees today uh, and focus right now on the path from uh, 10 to 50 million as our as a kind of our next big bogey point. Awesome. That's getting from just to remember the stats, getting from uh, zero to from zero to one is just 4% of all companies who are able to do it from one to 10 that you already made it. It's just 
0.4%. And now the next step is under 0.04%. So which means that less than 10% of the companies are able to go from 10 to 100 million. And, and congrats for being already 0.4% uh, of, uh, of companies. <laughs> so which shows I can't take all <laughs> That's right. And going to COVID-19 and um, how can we provide some best practices, tools, frameworks, uh, mindset shift for the ones in the scale-up world uh, and even in the corporate world as, as leaders are facing um, this, this storm. Um, how do we reprioritize uh, everything that we have prepared for 2020 that it seems it is completely expired at the end of, uh, of, of March or quarter one, and we still have three quarters uh, to go. And, and second, uh, especially when we have three different scenarios at this stage that are being discussed by investors and analysts, first scenario is that the new normal uh, that is becoming uh, very optimistic is that the new normal will come back in September. Uh, middle case scenario, January, February, uh, things will get to, to normal. And the worst case scenario, end of 2021. Uh, and, uh, and as we know, there are industries that are scaling like L, given the remote work environment. Hopefully it's, it's 15 five. And uh, there are companies that are, that are suffering uh, this stage. I would say the, main, the, the, the mainstream or the majority yeah. of the industries are not having a very good uh, time. So uh, what, what have be, you been doing with, you, with your team to the redefine your priorities? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And, and so as, as many high growth venture back companies do, 15.5 burns money, right? So we spend more than we make so that we can focus on growth, not profitability at this stage of our uh, development point. with a focus on growing market share. And so it's, that's like many of your listeners, I'm sure, but it's obviously important context uh, to the decisions that we're making at 15.5. And so, you know, as, as I'm sure everybody has read at this point, a hundred different places, uh, the guidance from every uh, investor out there is get 24 months of runway in place, right? And so the first thing that we did was we set out with our scenario planning, hopefully just as, as all of your listeners have done. Um, so we set out three different scenarios, plus we had our, uh, you know, the pre-approved board plan that we'd set up in January and agreed to. So we kind of have really four plans in place. Uh, but we created three new uh, scenarios to account for um, kind of different futures that could, that could evolve. We've tried to do a really good job in those scenarios of being hyper clear about what is the trigger point that uh, moves us from plan A to plan B to plan C. So that we're not trying to make a, uh, a nuanced decision in the moment um, when emotions can take over and it's unclear and it's a little bit too gray. We've tried to be really clear around here's what triggers us from A to B to C. Um, and then document in advance uh, what do we then do as we move from A to B to C uh, and have those decisions as much as possible um, made in advance to take a lot of the emotion out of it um, and to give us more clarity in the moment for when we do that. So the first thing was, okay, 24 months of runway with these three different scenarios. And then you got to pick one you operate against, right? So we've operated, we're operating against kind of plan A. Um, and so as we have thought about these three different scenarios, we've thought about them in kind of four buckets of activities that are happening across our company. So we have risk mitigation activities, we have maintained the business activities, we have experiments and we have big bets. So as we came into 2020, we were making pretty big investments in seven different uh, parts of 15.5. Right? So we had a lot of business as usual happening, but then we had product innovation happening over here messaging and brand activities happening over here, different sales activities, partnership activities. And so we defined seven kind of big bets that we were making, plus all the business as usual stuff. And so now we've moved in this world of saying, okay, most important thing is risk mitigation, right? What's going to happen with our existing customer base? What's going to happen to accounts payable, accounts receivable, and cash in this world of 24 months of, of runway that we're seeking? So we set up our activities and ensure that we were staffed appropriately for all of our risk mitigation activities. Then we uh, ensured that um, we looked at the seven big bets we were making and said, which ones are gonna generate, uh, either generate or save cash in our time horizon. So, so we picked a time horizon 
Um, we don't want to be investing in things that are going to produce results and produce cash for us 36 months from now when we have a 24 month uh, runway that we're targeting. So we right. picked our time horizon to say we wanted to create cash or save cash in our time frame. And so we then took our seven big bets and we pared it down to three big bets. So then we looked at our experiments, which were shorter duration activities that we weren't investing as much in those activities. Um, and we just kind of aligned and said, do those, do those experiments make sense in light of this global pandemic that's happening? Um, are these experiments likely to produce results if we have a worldwide recession? Um, so we, we, we matched it up against those. So we ensured first that our risk mitigation activities were staffed, that our big bets were staffed. And then we looked at staffing up against um, kind of maintaining the business or business as usual and those experiments in light of that. Um, once that was done, that really drove our OKRs. So we had created four company-wide OKRs at the beginning of the year. And we were then, once we had done that, we were able to reassess those OKRs and determine which ones still make sense and which ones need a revision and which ones are just kind of tossed out the window. Um, and so for us, it's mostly been in the world of, yes, these things still make sense. And here's a little bit of revision. Um, we've added one OKR um, for, a, for a big bet that we're making. Got it. That's that's quite amazing the way you structured it so so well. So the, the good news about the podcast is that you can repeat all over again because I would like to do it this after after the show and, and write it down uh, the process that you have uh, followed. So we we always discuss on the show free critical ingredients, radical focus, world class leadership, and yeah. uh, culture of execution. We were definitely discussing how to recalibrate, refocus, reassess, and redirect the energy and the focus of the company as the next step to get to, to the vision. Uh, and part of the of, of uh, world class leadership is first uh, take care of ourselves as leaders and stay centered, stay positive, stay optimist, but stay prepared for for the worst. It's aim for the best and prepare uh, for right. the for the worst. Uh, and of course, assuring that we have the right people on on the right seats, it's it's critical. And wartime and peacetime leaders uh, have very different mindsets. And and something even more important for very senior leaders is that they are able to adopt a peace mind mindset and a wartime or a peacetime mindset and a wartime mindset when necessary and adapt the leadership style yeah. more from more democratic to more autocratic, uh, to not give too much space for doubts, for fears to emerge and paralyze or panic uh, the leaders and, and the teams. So what, what's, what were some of your strategy or tactics and the way you organized the team to, to prepare for the war time or the crisis time for the ones who don't like war analogies for, for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're actually one of those companies that doesn't love the war analogies. And so yeah, we've been battling, pun intended, um, for, uh, for new language to bring into this thing. But, um, yeah. you know, we, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't figured out that problem. We still end up in a lot of those analogies ourselves. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really hard thing, right? Because you can't just go swap out your entire senior leadership team and be like, "Well, we're out of peacetime. We're now in wartime, so we need our new leaders to come in." Like that's just <laughs> not how it's not how business works. It's not how life works. You can't do that. And so, um, I I one of the interesting things that I was thinking about this question that came to mind for me was that yes, we do have to make some changes in how we lead. And, and I've got some thoughts on what those changes ought to be. But at the same time, there, when you're in a high growth venture back startup, there's a, there's a bit of it where you're kind of always in a wartime mentality, right? You're always focused on speed. You're always trying to use, um, you know, build out uh, competitive barriers. You're always trying to move quickly and with a sense of urgency because, you know, your runway is 24 months, 18 months, 12 months, right? Like you're always kind of running out of cash um, and knowing that you have to grow fast in order to raise your next round of capital and stay afloat because the one thing that drives every business out of, every company out of business is running out of cash. So there's a part of it where like, in our context, in my context, like we're kind of always at war. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, there's no such thing as peacetime in my context. Now it's different today, right? And so um, there are changes that need to be made, but there's 
there's still the consistent need for people to be moving with relentless focus, having a strong sense of urgency, always adaptable and ready to change, right? So those are the things that we want in our venture back startup all the time. Now those things become more important in this world today, right? So we built out a plan in January for 2020. We came back in in the middle of March and we've now changed all the plans, not all the plans, we've changed some of the plans. And so we have to have a whole team of people who one, uh, trust that we're doing the best that we can and making the right decisions, um, that we're being transparent about why we're doing the things that we're doing. I don't think that people expect perfection out of their leaders, but in order for them to trust their leaders, um, they do need to see alignment between word and deed, and they do need to have some visibility into why the decisions are being made that are being made. Um, and so, and then of course we have to have an even more ruthless focus uh, on the things that matter most because we don't have as much margin for error, right? You know, in a world where capital was pretty cheap um, and very plentiful, uh, we could make mistakes and absorb uh, a project that didn't work or poor execution against a good idea. Um, we now have less margin for error on bad ideas and we have less margin for error on, on poor execution on those ideas. And so that's where we went and said, okay, these, some of these investments that aren't gonna pay off uh, in our time horizon, we need to pull back on those things. So, um, you know, kind of my rules of thumb in times like this are, Number one, always tell the truth. Number two, be as transparent as you can. You can't be transparent about everything, but be as transparent as you can. Number three, uh, do celebrate the wins. Um, it becomes much more a game of celebrating some of the little things, um, not in a way that is designed to pull the wool over people's eyes, but is designed uh, as a way to uh, keep morale high and keep people recognizing that, like you know, there are there are good things happening. So. You know, we talk about our churn numbers, for example, and what's happening with downgrades and contraction, and we tell the truth on that. But we also look at like, and here's the number of customers who are continuing to expand their contracts because they know that 15.5 can help their team of remote workers. And so we want to be telling the truth about the good things, uh, not just the bad things. Um, but there's a lot of it that is kind of the same, right? We have to be moving quickly. We have to be focused. Um, and uh, we have to be building out you know, competitive differentiators and, and fighting off the, uh, that day when we run out of cash. So even more important, right? So because uh, focus is even more important today, as you said, we can't, we, we need to, to do even less bets and also have the courage to make those bets, but do just a few of them if we need to pivot the direction and even the messaging, the positioning statement of uh, our product and our company to the new um, reality. That, that's really uh, interesting. And, um, and something that I, we also had uh, on the show has been guests that are based in China, Shanghai, Beijing, and, and Shenzhen, for instance, um, discussing how how they are dealing with COVID-19 kind of 12 or 16 weeks uh, ahead of us in, in the rest of the world, even in Asia, because uh, Southeast Asia is also uh, at this stage, or, or India leaving the same kind of, um, of issues. And that's the kind of the same answer that you said about, about scale-ups. It's in China, there is always this wartime mentality. So it's a very competitive society, very competitive environment, it seems that it is always wartime, even uh, outside the scale-up um, world. Cool. And to number three, culture of execution. So this is, there, there is not no uh, time before that digital transformation and digitizing process and digitizing performance management systems uh, more important than today. And uh, it's, it's at the same time an exciting opportunity for 15.5 to, to help companies moving to work from home and having all those OKRs and those rhythms completely digitized it. So what is changing in your world um, working from home? Yeah. Um, so 15.5 is interesting. We, we, we're a global company. We have uh, approximately 200 employees, as I said. We have three hub offices, headquarters in San Francisco, an office in New York City, an office in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, one in uh, Ukraine and Lviv. And then uh, we have several people who work from home in Portugal and Spain and Poland. 
um, Latin America, and then of course across the United States as well while working from home. Amazing. And so we've we've operated the company as if everybody works remotely, even though we've had these offices where two thirds of our employees work in these offices. And so it's kind of like you work from home, but like in an office environment, which is kind of cool uh, with one of our values of embrace freedom and flexibility, uh, supporting those things. So uh, for us, it, it specifically at 15.5, the transition uh, to everybody working from home has been incredibly seamless. Um, I think we've seen challenges for uh, folks who obviously have kids climbing over top of them and they're trying to homeschool and not everybody has an office they can go into. And so they're working from the kitchen table. Um, and so there's been those things. And, and of course, we're offering everybody a lot of grace um, and a lot more flexibility around. We, we trust that you're doing the best that you can. Um, and your best that you're capable of today might be different than it was six weeks ago because you're now teaching a second grader math and you don't understand how that school system is teaching math anymore. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so there's a few different practices that we've employed um, always at 15.5 that I think have become even more important today. And there are some things that we've added as well, specifically uh, in our different regions where we, where we have these hub offices. So the first thing is that we've moved our senior leadership team meeting from once a week to twice a week. Uh, so instead of meeting on Mondays for an hour and a half, we're now meeting on Mondays and Thursdays uh, for 90 minutes and then 60 minutes um, and increasing the frequency with which we're getting together to make these big and important decisions because it is moving faster than it ever was before. Uh, we do a company-wide meeting every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We call it the Boost. Three times a week can sound like a lot, but there's a very specific purpose to each meeting. Uh, so our Monday meeting, which is 30 minutes, is kind of uh, revenue updates, company announcements, OKR reviews, um, things of that nature uh, to make sure everybody has a sense of how our business is performing. The Wednesday boost uh, starts off with a meditation. So we'll have a weekly meditation master, which will just be somebody from the team who will give a five minute meditation. Um, we believe in the business benefits of mindfulness. And so uh, we incorporate that into what we do. And we just give the whole company a chance to just sit down for five minutes and breathe and become very present. Um, and then we'll do something very educational. So think webinar style. Um, sometimes it'll be, you know, here's our marketing strategy for the, you know, for the year, for the quarter. Um, last week, we did an amazing webinar on resilience um, from our uh, director of people science. So she gave us this uh, amazing presentation on how to be resilient in a time of a pandemic. Um, and it'll, so the content there will vary, but it's a good chance to be together, have some mindfulness and then uh, learn. And the Friday one is something that we call Question Friday. <clears throat> With this distributed workforce and us believing that strong relationships increase psychological safety, which increases business performance, um, we'll have the question master uh, prompt a question. Then we go into breakout rooms on Zoom with about 15 people in each room. And we spend 20 minutes where everybody goes around and just answers the question. And it's usually a question about your personal life. Um, some of my favorites have been, what did your room look like when you were 15 years old, your bedroom when you were 15? And how did that influence who you are today? Uh, we did one that was, what is a bad habit you picked up from your parents? And what are you doing to break that habit today as an adult? Um, so it'll vary, but it's all designed to build this connection and the relational mastery that we think is so important to creating a high performing business uh, through those relationships. So that's our Monday, Wednesday, Friday cadence. We still do that. We've always done it over Zoom and we still do it today over Zoom. Many teams have added a 15 minute uh, daily stand up meeting. Um, there's some business value in that meeting, but a lot of the business value is simply just giving these extroverts a chance to come together and connect and see one another face to face. Every single team that is doing a stand up meeting has a specific set of prompts uh, that they go through. Oftentimes it will be somewhere around the world of, you know, what was your goal for yesterday? Did you accomplish it? What is your goal for today? Are you stuck on anything? And what wins do you have to celebrate? And then give somebody on the team a, a high five, like, you know, compliment and appreciate somebody on the team. Every team's doing something a little bit different, but that, that meeting is really designed for morale and team building more than anything else. Um, and, and each department's doing them a little bit differently based on what their, their teams need. Last couple of things, um, for me as the CRO, I think I oversee six departments or five departments, something like that. Um, I'm trying to go to 
the stand up, the, if you got daily standups across all these teams, I'm trying to show up at least once per week for each team, just to be present, answer a couple of questions, give my real life high fives, tell people my wins and where I'm stuck. Uh, and just to be present and a little bit more visible. So they're all on my calendar and I just pop in when I can. Um, we are looking at our leading metrics uh, on an almost daily basis. Uh, we're updating them daily, distributing them to the SLT and out to the company consistently. Um, and then the last thing uh, that I'll share is that um, in a way that I haven't done before, maybe I should have, but every Friday I send a Slack message to the whole company now that just gives the, the Friday update. And uh, I'm explaining what are we seeing with revenue? What wins do we have to celebrate? What changes are we making in response to this pandemic? And just trying to be really uh, on top of keeping people up to date on a weekly basis. Um, and the I think the consistency there is giving people um, some of the trust and transparency and visibility that they need. That's, uh, again, an amazing part to repeat again in the podcast and, and just write it down the rhythms that you can apply um, yeah. to your company at, um, at this stage. And, and it's something very interesting is, is the way you, are, you keep building, and this is something uh, already from pre-COVID-19, how much value you give to, to values, to culture, and to personal uh, development. Uh, I heard a recent podcast with uh, with your CEO. I think it was in this week in startups uh, with Jason Kalakanis, uh, yeah. which was one of the early investors um, yes. of uh, fifteen five, if I'm if I'm not wrong from from the podcast, where That's your right. your CEO uh, talks a lot about this importance. And, and Jason kind of challenged back your uh, your CEO saying. Uh, and what about the people that don't like too much to do meditation together and talk about yeah. themselves and so on? And, and he said, that's why it, it's part of the value. So we try to bring people that enjoy to do that because we don't want anybody to feel obliged to do this. So we, we try to attract people who are comfortable and we enjoy doing this. And of course, we don't force anybody to... Um, right to expose uh, themselves. So it's a very good point in terms of culture. It is it's possible to build culture and to promote culture in, in a working from home environment and starting with a working from home setup, even if you have uh, offices, that, that's a good way um, to do it. So amazing, very, very well done uh, on top of the point for, for, for uh, point for, 4%. And we come to the last question of the show. You have already yeah. um, uh, replied this question in the last show. So I will do a quick uh, improvisation. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah. Which would be, That's great. if you would have the opportunity to meet Brad at the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, mm -hmm. what advice would you offer to that Brad of uh, 16 weeks or eight weeks uh, ago? Yeah. Um... So the, the, have you ever heard of something called the serenity prayer? So, uh, yes, absolutely. That's an amazing one. Yeah. yeah. So, so the serenity prayer, um, uh, it's, I learned about it. I, I have some family members who have gone through Alcoholics Anonymous and, and um, the serenity prayer is very popular inside of AA. And the serenity prayer simply says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. Right the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And so, uh, man, if I could go back a few weeks and just say like, look, when you're reading the news, <laughs> like read the news accepted. lens up, accepting what you cannot change, using the news to change the things that you can inside of your business or your personal life or whatever. And the wisdom to know the difference. I, I think that right now we are in this world where um, so many people are scared so many people are scared of things that they cannot control and there's literally nothing you can do about it. Um, I mean, think about all the restaurant workers or the, the transportation and airline and travel work. Like they, they can't, there's literally nothing they can do about it. Absolutely. And, um, but there are things that they can change. Um, and there's things in my life that I cannot change and things that I can. And so, um, man, I just feel like the serenity prayer is one of these things right now where it just helps me. It, it literally helps me sleep at night. Um, just to accept those things, think about what I can change and, and try to take action about it and be proactive. 
and then just, you know, relax to the best that I can after that. <laughs> This is a great opportunity to give you uh, I-5 and ads off. I know that you are also at home with, with free kids, which, uh, which yep. we were discussing before the show. Yeah. So an I-5 uh, for you and a recognition and an applause sure, to yeah. you. By the way, uh, <laughs> that, that's for, for the ones who are just listening and not aware what is happening at this exact moment, but one of the kids and a daughter of, of Brad just came in uh, to to the room and uh, I five to uh, to her as well. So Brad, thank you so much for making the time and to joining us on the show uh, for the second time to 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 let our, our audience know how to deal with the uh, COVID nineteen crisis. Thanks again for joining us. Absolutely, Mike. Thank you for having me. And uh, to you, we keep bringing you the best of the best, very practical tools playbooks, best practices to be well prepared to keep scaling during the crisis or to be prepared to scale after the crisis. Stay strong, stay healthy and keep scaling.